The island of Cape Breton is widely considered to be one of the most beautiful tourist destinations in the world, known for its unique Scots and Acadian cultures and the Mi'kmaq people which are its ancient inhabitants. People visit for our pristine nature, our wonderful food, and the wonderful music. Outside of Scotland and Ireland, Cape Breton is probably the world's leading producer of Celtic music. But there are perhaps two things that draw people to the island of Cape Breton even more than that. The fantastic autumn colors, and the rugged beauty of the world-famous Cape Breton Highlands National Park. But what those visitors might not know is the island of Cape Breton is being almost entirely denuded of its gorgeous native Acadian forest to serve the interests of pulp and timber cartels and the delusion of biofuel, which is quite literally the cutting of forest to burn like coal, a concept being promoted by the pulp cartel, the Nova Scotia government, neither of which are terribly surprising since they've long been in cahoots, but also, and perhaps less known, by many countries in the European Union, which knowingly and falsely promote the burning of biofuels as a net carbon zero source of energy. So once again today, I'm going to take you on a virtual flight, this time from a tiny airport in Bedeck, north across the very heart of the Cape Breton Highlands, to a semi-remote lake at the southern border of the Cape Breton Highlands National Park. This time, we'll use a simulated version of the Icon A5 aircraft, which affords excellent views and is at this time the only amphibious aircraft available in the simulator. The most recent iteration of the Microsoft Flight Simulator, sometimes dubbed FS2020, applies revolutionary technology to simulate an almost photorealistic environment. The imagery that you will see is taken from actual satellite photography which means that if you were in that location, you would see the same thing that we're going to see in the Microsoft Flight Simulator. Using a technique called photogrammetry, the Microsoft Flight Simulator translates aerial and satellite photography into three-dimensional images so that they can be used for training and flight simulation purposes. For our purposes, the important thing to understand is that while the photogrammetry is virtual, in other words, computer-generated, the imagery itself is taken from actual photography. What you're going to see in a nutshell is what is really there. So we've already taken off from the Bedeck Airport, and I'm going to ignore air traffic controls directives since this is only a simulated flight with other purposes than training in mind. And we're going to follow the course that you can see plotted on the GPS. Except, instead of following the legs exactly, we're going to fly to roughly between them, and then turn north, heading right up the middle of the island. By flying at several thousand feet, right up the middle of the arm of the island, we'll get an expansive view of the wild highlands where few persons ever go. And what you're going to see is the heart of the island's forests have been absolutely gutted. And it's important to fly right over the middle of this terrain because the timber and pulp cartels and the biofuel industry are very careful to keep the damage hidden from the average viewer. Most people will never get that far off the beaten path. Even hunters rarely go more than a couple miles from a main road or a well-used back road, and once they're on foot, they rarely go more than two or three hundred meters from wherever they set out. So unless you are airborne or really committed to roughing it, the average person just is not going to see this. But the damage is real. Its impact to the environment is real. These forests are massive carbon sinks, important scrubbers for air quality, essential for water purification and soil retention. And the Acadian forest is a unique ecosystem in all the world making it tremendously important as a biodiversity bank and crucial for many migrating species. But most of it has been so devastated that only a tiny fraction of it remains. But as quickly as possible, timber and pulp cartels and biofuel interests are mowing it down, clearing it away so that they can make room for monocrop tree farms of conifers. Ahead of us is the gorgeous Marguerite Valley upon which one will find much of the beauty of the famous Cabot Trail, and home to persons who have lived and worked this land since their ancestors first arrived centuries ago out of an impoverished Scotland. I myself have friends there and visit several times per year from my own homestead, not too far south, and the beauty is inspiring, yet also heartbreaking, because from the valley the harm is hidden. But if you get just over the lip of it and a bit north, one cannot escape the tragic reality of it. It is unfortunate that I must say that you'll see what I mean in only a few minutes. For now, we're going to continue flying this course till we reach the western tip of the long narrow lakes ahead, and that will be our visual marker that it's time to turn north. 
To the middle right of the screen, just above the dash, you can see those lakes coming into view. And they're also shown on the console in the middle of the dash. As soon as we reach those lakes, we'll veer right. Presently, we're flying about 3,000 feet above sea level. The highlands themselves rise six to 900 feet in most places, placing us on average about 2,250 feet above ground level. By and large, for the rest of this journey, except for down in those valleys, you can consider that you're seeing the world from between 22 and 2,300 feet. The Cape Breton Highlands are part of the ancient Adirondack Mountain Range. A billion years ago, this range was far more impressive and would have rivaled the Himalayas. But time has long since leveled those long gone mountains, and the landscape we see today is set upon their roots. And so it is that even geologically history echoes throughout the landscape of Cape Breton. It is a home to the lost old ways of Scots culture, and before them the Acadians, and before them the First Peoples, the Mima and before them an ancient landscape of megafauna from an ice age world now long gone and forgotten. And when the first Scots and Acadian colonists arrived, a land of reindeer, bears and wolves, though the activities of people, as is so often the case throughout the world, has long since driven those majestic creatures away to landscapes far more wild, cold and inimical to the presence of humans. There is a substantial crosswind coming out of the northeast, and each time I relax my attention to the stick to show you the views all around the aircraft, she wants to bank to the south in response to that wind. When we did the virtual tour of the clear cuts around the Kejumkujik National Park, I used the Cub Crafter, a very capable bush plane that nicely had an autopilot. The Icon A5 does not, so I'll have to watch the stick much more closely as I go about showing you what lies ahead. The perspective might not be as steady as the last video I shot either. I could put the Cub Crafter in autopilot and use a mouse to control the perspective. But, as the Icon A5 has no autopilot, I have to keep a hand on the stick and a hand on the throttle, so I have to use an infrared head tracker, which allows me to see whenever I operate the simulator in whatever direction I point my head. The problem is, I have to work really hard to keep my head still so that the scene is not always moving around for you, becoming disorienting. Up over the lip of the valley, just over there to the south a couple miles away, we're seeing some of the clear cuts now. They're always over the lip of the valleys, most of the people live in the valleys, and up in the highlands, just out of sight, out of mind. Hike up those ridges, and everywhere you go, you will find these clear cuts. The situation is so bad, sometimes I don't know where local firewood cutters and musical instrument makers find hardwood anymore. The simple fact is, if you go down almost any country road anywhere in Nova Scotia and find yourself in the woods, if you just stop your vehicle, get out and walk a hundred meters or so, you will shortly, very likely find yourself standing in a clear cut. They are everywhere, they are vast, and you would not think they are so easy to hide, but in Cape Breton they are often hidden by placing them on the plateaus above the highlands, and even in flat lowlands they can be well concealed by leaving cosmetic hedges of uncut trees only a dozen meters or so thick. But our native hardwood forests are not only being cut, they're being prevented from growing back. The pulp and lumber cartels in particular want conifers. For them, the Acadian forests are just a nuisance to get out of the way. They want those forests cut, and they want to replace them with conifer tree farms. And they are so determined to accomplish that goal, that frequently they cut these forests, replant their tree farms, and then go back and visit them periodically to spray with glyphosate in order to prevent the growth of any more hardwood trees. To the untrained eye, those tree farms may look like forests, but the fact is, ecologically speaking, they are almost useless. They are very dense, animals can barely move through them, they are monocrops, so there is not a good diversity of food, they don't do well at handling soil retention or do much for water purity, and they are fire hazards. In a previous video I made, Firebomb Forest, we examine just how easy it is to ignite conifer woods. Conifers are trees that are filled with pitch, making the trees themselves something like very dense wicks. It doesn't take much to light them, and once lit, it doesn't take much to keep them burning. Now if you should think that anything that I've just said about the shortage of hardwood is speculation, I'm going to cite this article, Westville Sawmill Felt by Wood Shortage, Layoffs Coming, produced by the CBC. The article goes on to say that the Department of Lands and Forestry, then known as the Department of Natural Resources, 
says that there is still plenty of hardwoods to harvest in Nova Scotia, but as we talked about in my video on the Ketchum Kuja clear cuts, the Department of Natural Resources changed its name to the Department of Lands and Forestry, clearly indicating its alliance with industrial forestry interests. Any independent biologist or ecologist that I know is greatly concerned about the rapidly declining number of hardwood trees or deciduous Acadian forests that still remain in Nova Scotia. However, if you go and dig into that article, you'll see something even more nefarious in that the biofuel and pulp corporations are given lead to, air quote, manage vast expanses of crown lands. And there is reason to believe they are attempting to price gouge small sawmills why would they attempt to do so? Well again, from the perspective of biofuel, pulp and lumber cartels, hardwood forests really are just something to get out of the way. They can produce more wood and faster by removing deciduous trees and replacing them with conifer plantations. Or in the case of biofuel, removing native forests and replacing them with fast-growing broadleaf trees such as poplar. So removing those hardwoods once and for all works for them in the long run. We are traveling roughly north now, just up from the Marguerite Valley, and ahead of us, just past that line of trees down there, and in fact all around us, now begins the clear cuts in earnest. There, off out the port window, you can see the farms of the Marguerite Valley. It's a beautiful little place, tranquil and peaceful, full of a gentle folk, rich with old traditions, but just up in those highlands, just out of sight and out of mind just ahead of us are endless clear cuts where the natural deciduous Acadian forests have been removed and either have been or will be replaced with conifer plantations. We're flying right up the middle of the northwest arm of the island of Cape Breton which covers a huge percent of the island's total landmass. And whether you look east, west, or north, clear cuts as far as the eye can see, all the way to the horizon and beyond. And presently, we're about 2,500 feet AGL, so the horizon is a long way away. Many, many miles. So far, in fact, that detail simply disappears into the distortion of the atmosphere. We're flying over a patch of woods right here, and there are some areas of preserved ground throughout here. But if you look just a mile or so to the east, again, all the way out to the ocean, or at least the coastal area where people dwell, more clear cuts, endless clear cuts as far as you can see, but out of sight and largely out of mind. It can sometimes be difficult to interpret terrain seen from altitude. I remember long ago when I was an undergrad student taking a geology class, the first time my then professor showed us imagery taken of the Yukon Territory using high altitude aircraft. I looked across that image and could gain a rough understanding of where the hills and valleys were, mostly by the shadowed contours of the land, but I could hardly understand what I was seeing beyond that. It takes some training to understand high altitude imagery, so I'm going to run you through roughly what it is that you're seeing just in case you aren't familiar. The light green patches with what appears to be little spheres just below us, well, that's deciduous forest. You've probably gathered that already. Ahead of us, you'll see pale expanses. Some tend toward greenish, some darker, more earthy in color. The greenish ones are older clear cuts, a year, five years, 10 years. That's quite recent in the scale of tree growth, but older tree cuts nonetheless that have grown back a bit of herbaceous foliage. The darker, earthy ones are newer clear cuts where the damaged soil is still exposed to rain, wind, and sky. All clear cuts are erosion hazards, though these fresh clear cuts especially so, as their native forest has been ripped away. The heavy machinery used to do it has very much torn up the ground, leaving unbelievably deep ruts in the soil that compress away its ability to hold water and maintain the fungi and flora that are essential for soil retention and health. I've seen these ruts and water grounds so deep that I had to climb down into them and up and back out of them to move over such terrain. As soil flora is barely understood, we know less than 1% of the organisms that grow in it to make it healthy. It is unknown how long it truly takes soil damaged in this way to recover. 
But one thing I can tell you for sure is that this soil is an erosion hazard. Northern lakes and streams are naturally clear and pure. They are not good at handling the massive loads of nutrient that such erosion brings to them. It leads to toxic algal blooms that cause deoxygenation, which kills fish, the animals that drink from those bodies of water, and now and then people. Now some of the clearings down there will be natural. They will not be the large, angular things you see in the distance, but if you look close to us, you'll see the white bands of dirt country roads. And there was a non-angular clearing there. That could be a natural break in the forest. And up ahead in the middle ground, you'll see more white lines that demark dirt roads. These are straight and stop among the trees, so they're probably forestry roads, as that is their pattern. We're drifting a little westward, so I'm just going to make a course correction here and bring us heading more toward the center of the island's arm, flying straight toward, or at least roughly straight toward, a large lake a few miles ahead known as the Shetikamp Flowage. That's where we'll land. So with our course corrected, we'll continue along right about this altitude, about 2,800 feet air to sea level, and continue to see what the flight might show us. Now I want to emphasize again, this is a flight simulator, the Microsoft Flight Simulator version 2020, but the imagery that you're seeing is taken directly from satellite imagery and also aerial photography. What you're seeing is what is actually there. If you were to go to that location, you would see what is there. Photogrammetry makes some small errors typically in relating the heights of things, such as the heights of buildings or depth of water. These are bugs that will probably be ironed out pretty well in the near future as this brand new application continues to be developed. But overall, it relates what you would find anywhere in the world extraordinarily well. In fact, at the end of this video, we'll go back and take a look at the actual satellite imagery from which the photogrammetry was made. If anything, I think the photogrammetry is being kind because the satellite imagery, dated to 2020, this year, looks straight down on those vast clear cuts, exposing the savaged earth beneath where once tranquil and healing forests had been ripped away not so very long ago. Flying in a virtual aircraft closer to the ground reveals them from a perspective that is more natural and easier for people to understand, but also seeing them from this low to the ground shows them at an angle, which somewhat conceals just how badly the land has been hurt. Off in that direction is the old and scenic village of Shetikamp. I have land not too far from there, just outside the Highlands National Park, and I love to visit, and I can tell you firsthand from Shetikamp itself, you would not know that this landscape has been so savaged. Here it is from a top-down view, where I set the flight simulator's camera about 200 meters or 600 feet or so above the aircraft. The landscape has been brutally savaged, more clear-cut than woodlands, and to the right of the screen, where you might think you see dark green trees, that is not the summer color of healthy deciduous Acadian forest, but rather the dark green of conifers, tree plantations regrowing. And the clear cuts in tree plantations keep going as an endless patchwork of ecological destruction into the distance. Now we're starting to leave behind the clear cuts in the tree plantations. Down below, you are seeing the paler green and rounded forms of the trees of deciduous forests. How old or healthy or intact those forests are, I cannot tell you from this altitude. I've been through them and what I can say is they're better in some places than they are in others. Down in the gullies and in steep terrain where the logging trucks have never been able to go, one might feel that one is in an intact forest, though it is lacking in biodiversity, particularly animals that require much more t terrain than those gullies can provide. But east and north, virtually abutting that lake over there, you'll see more clear cuts. You can tell those are clear cuts by the diminutive islands of trees 10 or 20 meters in diameter that are scattered through them. The pulp timber and biofuel cartels, as well as the Department of Lands and Forestry, will try to tell you that those are left there for shelter for animals. In truth, those tiny shelters accomplish nothing. Wildlife is not going to pack into convenient little 10 or 20 meter diameter circles like humans into an apartment complex just because those raping the forest would find it convenient for them to do so. Don't buy the lie. Anybody who studies wildlife or tracks understands that those so-called wildlife shelters hold nothing but a few red squirrels and black-capped finches. And where those clear cuts stand, the ecology of the ancient Acadian forest that was once there is gone. And as it takes centuries for such an ecology to re-establish, when those forests are cut, they are effectively gone for life. And if they ever were to heal and regrow, 
There would have to be some sacrosanct and untouchable wildland to serve as a biodiversity bank. Right now a few healthy woodlands remain, but they're rapidly diminishing. If Nova Scotia keeps going the way it's going, there won't even be a biodiversity bank for the Acadian forest to ever come back. At this point in time, less than 1% of the old growth Acadian forest remains, or in other words, more than 99% of the old growth Acadian forest has been clear cut. All that remains are rare and fading remnants. Sparks of what was once a glowing and sacred fire of life. Now only the tormented echo of a foregone earth where life was once much more abundant and varied. I came to Nova Scotia quite a few years ago from the northern bush. And out there, in truly wild country, wildlife, including large fauna, are so abundant. Whereas here, it's really quite rare to encounter a variety of wildlife. What I'm saying is that having been in a truly wild place, and now being here where so much of the land has been harmed and damaged in the endless pursuit of money, I find myself keenly ever aware of just how brutally and profoundly Nova Scotia's ecosystems have been savaged. This damage began centuries ago with the first colonists, but the truth is, with the rise of modern technology, great machines that tear over the land and rip down forests as easily as a child might break matches, most of the damage has been done in just the last two generations. Alright, the lake where we're going to land is just a bit further north, and we're flying over the southern side of the Cape Breton Highlands National Park now. So we're going to be by and large past the clear cuts. Off to the left, we see irregular breaks in the forest. Those are natural breaks. You can tell by the water down there and the regular shape of the boundaries of the trees that they are natural, and very likely great places to find blueberries and cranberries, though they could be hazardous to walk in. Though, if you go quietly and gently, you can not only fill your hat with berries, but if you keep a camera with you, you can catch some great footage of some amazing wildlife. Lovely migratory birds that depend on such places. We'll see more of this low wet ground as we get closer to the lake. The land is spilling into a drainage area. The region called the Shadecomb Flowage. I can't help but wish I had some way to get down there though. Because I have to admit, I do enjoy wild cranberries and blueberries. And in the high ground, just at the edge of those wetlands, would likely be a great place to find some Labrador tea. But it's very difficult walking over such ground. Wet and cold and treacherous. I want to keep this virtual flight, just as I did with the Kejum Kujik virtual flight, just as realistic as possible to help you understand the difference between healthy woodlands, which you're seeing below, this is the Cape Breton Highlands National Park itself, versus those clear cuts that you saw behind us. And I think that sitting in an aircraft, even if it's a virtual aircraft, will help the typical viewer to really understand and get a feel for what they're seeing. So we're going to follow through with the entire flight, including the landing down onto the lake. We're going to be setting down in just a couple minutes. At this point, I need to begin decelerating and dropping altitude. Aircraft in the movies travel up and down very quickly. In reality, a small aircraft like this, which is built much more for comfort than practicality, can only move up and down by a few hundred feet per minute safely. Go down too fast, you'll over accelerate, tear the wings off. Go up too fast, well, you might overstress the engine or the frame. So we're going to slowly decelerate as we get closer to that lake. And just about in the next few moments, we're going to go ahead and bank to the right. And I'm going to line us up with the longest, clearest path to land so that I can touch this plane down on the lake. I'm not terribly fond of the Icon A5, I have to say. That's this virtual plane that we're using because it's not like a practical Cessna. It's much more like a toy, a rich person's toy, I guess, a toy plane, uh, maybe a flying jet ski, and it, it's just more fragile and takes more room to land than I would prefer. Still, we'll make it work for us, and we'll set it down up ahead, and then we'll go and take a look at the satellite imagery and have a look, a review of what it is that we've experienced in this flight, and take a moment to gain perspective on just how truly far-reaching those clear cuts are should we increase our perspective to that of from space. All right, we're just about to touch down here. I'm going to go ahead and give her full flaps so I can raise my nose up so that we don't dive nose first into the water when we touch down. We'll pull our throttle back all the way. 
so we can decrease the plane's energy. I'd like to have the airspeed down to just a few dozen knots by the time we touch down. And here, we're just going to drop a meter every few seconds for the last little bit until we hear her hitting water. And with the water skimming along beneath the hull, she'll decelerate pretty quickly now. All right, so having touched down and decelerated, we'll drop the water rudder so we can steer and just bring her to a nice safe dead stop. Here, within the safety of the confines of the park, actually this lake itself is not technically in the park, it's more that it's surrounded on most sides by the park, but here we have entered some beautiful country, unblemished and unhurt by the brutality of the rapid and frankly insane degree of clear-cutting that is going on all over Nova Scotia. Our forests are being clear-cut and depleted far faster than they can possibly regenerate. Indeed, the Department of Lands and Forestry says that if these forests are cut and replanted, they reach maturity again in 80 years. In reality, the trees might be big in 80 years, but trees are very long-lived organisms that have lifespans of centuries, and in 80 years, they're barely out of adolescence. And the ecosystems they support can take centuries to fully mature. So we launched at this little airport just outside the village of Bedek, and we flew roughly northwest toward the tiny airport in the Marguerites. And about halfway in between, at the foot of the lakes, we turned north, heading right up the middle of the island in the direction of this lake, the Shedikamp Flowage. This satellite photo shows the terrain we flew over. This is the vast northwest arm of Cape Breton Island, zoomed in a little, showing everything but the coastal terrain. As you can see, a huge percentage of the interior has been clear-cut. The clear-cuts do stop, more or less, as we approach either coast of this arm of the island. But if you look at the terrain closely, you can see that it becomes very rugged. So the cutting in those areas has stopped, in part because the land there is difficult to get over with heavy machinery. And also, because the closer it is to the coast, the more likely it is to be visible to the passers-by. And absolutely, the Nova Scotia government, which loves to promote Cape Breton as a tourist destination, does not want tourists to see just how brutally devastated the landscape abutting the Cape Breton Highlands National Park truly is. Yes, if you stick to the highways, the tourist routes, and the tourist traps, you're not going to see much of this. Maybe a hint of it now and then, just over the lip of a ridge, particularly if it's over private land, because small private landowners can largely do what they want with their land. But the vast clear cuts, the clear cuts that are over crown land and the really massive private holdings, these stay tucked away, hidden. The pulp and lumber and biofuel cartel, DLFs, and the Nova Scotia government's dirty little secret. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. Please take a moment to subscribe. It costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.